You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. AT&T spied on its customers for profit. The Pentagon steals from soldiers. A cyber war is heating up. Updates on Syria, Greece, and Venezuela. Plus, Open Bazaar is set to deploy stores. All this and more on episode 179 here on Wednesday, October 26th, 2016. JJ, in the traditional market. Markets, we have gold trading at $1,267, silver's at $17.59, oil's at $49.21, slight dip there. Uh, the Dow's still trading at $18,000, uh, specifically $18,199, and the U.S. Treasury is yielding 2.5, the 30 year Treasury is yielding 2.543%. The Euro's trading around $1.09 Euro cents, and the Yuan is uh, 15 cents on the dollar, and the British pound, it's 15 U.S. cents per yuan, and the British pound is trading at $1.22 per pound. And in the crypto markets, we've got Bitcoin up at $675, Litecoin at $3.93, Ethereum at $11.50, Dash at $9.24, Monero uh, recovering a bit from last week's low at uh, $5.99. Steam, again, losing uh, about 40% of its value from last week, now down to $0.14. AMP is at about $0.15. And we've got Augur Rep tokens at about $5.02. And Darren, one doge is still at one doge. Wow. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews? Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and more. We actually have a special episode that we posted last Friday. We interviewed Roger Ver, Bitcoin Angel Investor, Bitcoin Angel Investor and CEO of Bitcoin.com, as and discussed how the current Bitcoin block size limit is throttling the Bitcoin network while increasing transaction times and transaction fees. And how Bitcoin Unlimited could be posed to increase the block size and how the network uh, could scale. Uh, Check us out at neocashradio.com. All right, so an update on the U.S.-Russia proxy war in Syria. A Chicago Tribune article highlights the ridiculous nature of the conflict ongoing in Syria. Pentagon-funded rebels are battling CIA-funded rebels and vice versa. And in some cases, both groups are working with, coming from, or defecting to Islamic State militant groups. The only thing that is certain in, in, is that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia have funded or supplied much of the unrest that is intended to destabilize Syrian President Assad to foment re- regime change. So these are mercenaries. That's right. So all of it's paid mercenaries. And there's no civil war going on in Syria, which is what a lot of Western news media keep saying. There's no civil war. The war is between outside mercenaries and the people inside Syria. Isn't there some Monty Python sketch like this? I don't know. Where, like <laughs> the, the people are fighting themselves, but this is, yeah, Pentagon funded versus CIA funded mercenaries fighting each other and then defecting to other yeah, groups, just right, whoever's exactly, paying the most. Exactly. And in fact, um, we'll have links on our blog at neocashradio.com, but you can watch a video where they, they have a video where one guy is shooting, I believe it is a, a Pentagon funded tow rocket that hits a CIA funded Humvee vehicle. And it is just just explicit right there. This is what's going on in Syria. The U.S. is fighting everybody. U.S. tax dollars hard at work on there both sides. Well, Russia being there has definitely thrown a wrench in U.S.'s plans. And America needs Russia as an advertise, uh, adversary, I should say, says Karen Kutwaski, a retired, uh, retired U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonel. Uh, NATO generals have leaked... Uh, had leaked emails that exposed their plot to stir up conflict, including a show of force this summer with the largest war games operation since the Cold War. German foreign foreign minister said, what we shouldn't do now is inflame the situation further through saber-rattling and warmongering. Now, this was going on back this summer when they were saying this warmongering was happening. More recently, NATO has been moving troops to the Russian border, as if Russians going to start invading neighbors, neighboring countries any day now. The Western media makes a point to nitpick Russian airstrikes while sweeping U.S. collateral damage under the rug. A Russian naval group is heading to the Mediterranean, and a NATO row over Spain refueling the strip ships highlights how misplaced outrage is. Given the escalation hyperbolic rhetoric, World War III may start before Hillary Clinton takes office. So that's the, the latest going on there. Wow. And it doesn't seem very 
hopeful, I should say. Yeah, and JJ, you talked a lot about this, the the U.S. proxy war just a few weeks ago on uh, episode 177. You kind of gave a little bit of a, a, an overview of uh, the situation there. So if anyone wants to check that out, it was uh, episode 177. Excellent. So we've got a cyber war to talk about, Randy. Yeah, not just on the ground. We've got trouble uh, uh, in, in the interwebs as well. So... Uh, late last week, there was actually a large and sustained internet attack that caused outages and network congestion for a, a huge number of websites, including Twitter, Amazon, Tumblr, Reddit, PayPal, Spotify, Airbnb, Netflix, you name it. Um, turns out what happened, there was a, it was a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS attack uh, that was launched with the help of IoT devices, Internet of Things devices, so things like closed circuit security cameras, uh, DVRs. Um, what, was ha what happened was there was this malware strain called Mirai that was used to scour the internet for these IoT devices that were protected by really crappy, insecure, factory default usernames and passwords. And when it would find these devices, it would overtake them and launch junk, like just junk traffic at specific online targets, uh, which locks out legitimate visitors or users. Uh, the target was actually Dyne, which is here in Manchester, New Hampshire, funny That's enough. Right. Um, it's a huge inf internet infrastructure company that that's, yeah, just a few blocks away from where we're sitting. Um, so one of the manufacturers behind a lot of these cameras, uh, that was allegedly utilized for this attack, Shang Mai, uh, technologies is reportedly recalling millions of its products. Um, so yeah, we saw a really big, we were feeling it here at the house. We thought it might've been another, uh, Ethereum minor DDoS attack, but no, right. this time, it was maybe something different. So um, KrebsOnSecurity.com is where we got this link, and, and Michael Krebs has been uh, following this after actually the Mirai malware was uh, flooding his site last last month with a, a huge uh, bit of traffic. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing with the tools out there, of course. <laughs> and yes, anybody can pretty much do this, but oftentimes it takes a more coordinated effort to, to make these attacks actually successful. Um, but we've got news about... A different kind of uh, scandal, I should say. Uh, what, what's going on with AT&T, Darren? Yeah, so AT&T AT uh, is secretly making millions uh, selling customer data to law enforcement. Now, this is uh, something I've heard hinted at uh, in in the past. But uh, So in episode 176, we covered the story about Yahoo secretly scanning user emails for the government. AT&T has a confession to make as well. Uh, Project Hemisphere is a spy tool for law enforcement use with agencies paying from $100,000 to over a million dollars. Wow. So that's e for each agency. Uh, and so, uh, and and that's for uh, the, 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 sp the spy tool that allows uh, someone to see which cell towers the a person is using and as well as uh, access to calls, uh, call data and text data uh, and other phone use. So, so basically, it's, it's a company you buy a service from secretly betraying your trust, selling your data to a law enforcement agency that you're forced to pay for. Is, is, I mean, that's sort of it in, in, in a nutshell. That's, well, yeah. You're, you're paying it on both ends. You're People paying... pay taxes. Yes. And it's actually illegal for the government to go out and collect this information. Right. However... AT&T can go out and collect this information. That's legal. And then when AT&T has this information, they can sell it to the government and the taxpayer pays for that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you're paying AT&T and the law enforcement agency through your taxes to, yeah, to, to spy on you, essentially. Yeah. So stop hitting yourself. <laughs> Maybe if I didn't dress this way. <laughs> so there's more more news about AT&T. Yeah, though. yeah, this has come to light just as AT&T is looking to become the largest media company in the world. Wireless communications and paid television provider uh, AT&T has finalized a deal to purchase media giant Time Warner for 85.4 billion dollars in a half stock half cash deal. Uh, this uh, which includes uh, money from the spying program that they, they sold the data for. Right. Um, it's not, it's not how that works. <laughs> included in the package from Time Warner are CNN, TNT, HBO, and the Warner Brothers uh, film TV studio as, and the rights to the Batman franchise from DC Comics. Wow. Uh, Batman wow. wouldn't stand for this crap. Wow. It, it may face an uphill regulatory battle. The deal would reportedly could co reportedly close as soon as 2017. 
And that, wow, they're yeah, that's, that's a huge company. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's AT and T that they broke up. Remember? Right, they've already broken up AT and T. Yeah, once. so they broke them up once, and so we've now we need to get before. back together. And yeah, we've been here before. <laughs> yeah, there's a glitch in the matrix, man. Right. Although um, Time Warner wasn't a spinoff of AT and T, it's not one of the Baby Bells. Well, we've got updates uh, to talk about this week as well, and we're going to start out with Greece, Randy. What's yeah? The news? Back to Greece. So uh, apparently, eurozone creditors think they are taking the correct that Greece is taking the correct steps to correct their economic problems. Uh, just yesterday morning, creditors approved a 2.8 billion euro bailout to uh, Greece after the government created a privatization fund to pay down some of their debt, and they've also completed several prescribed economic reforms to the pension system and in the energy sector. Uh, so 1.7 billion euros of the loans will be used for clearing arrears owed to domestic contractors, so things that are already past due, uh, and the remaining 1.1 billion euros will be used for debt servicing, which I, that just sounds like paying down interest. Right. That sounds like a fancy term. Exactly. Uh, Correct that's, me that's if I'm what wrong. It is, yeah. Okay. Wow. Debt servicing. Debt servicing. <laughs> The uh, This approval from creditors marks the end of the first review of Greece's 86 billion euro bailout, which was approved in August of 2015. So uh, it appears that they're doing some things to now start paying down the debt by taking on more loans to... Yeah. yeah. Right. How, you, how's that going to work out? We've been here before. <laughs> well, usually debt servicing just means that they pay the interest and like, like that's how much you would need to pay just to pay the interest. So that, and so you service the debt, you, you have kept it at the same amount Mm -hmm. and not let it increase. So avoiding default and all that. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, it depends on the terms of the loan as well. Sure. Well, and JJ, you said that this kind of reminded you of Confessions of an Economic yeah. Hitman. Greece is offering up natural resources to foreign bidders. Uh, French and Italian companies are in line to secure blocks for deep sea gas and oil drilling. And there's also the migrant uh, issue going on. They've had over, they've had 169,000 plus arrivals through the Aegean Sea this year so far. And that doesn't count, of course, the 3,671 people who were not able to make the trip across that perilous crossing. Hmm. And uh, the Greek islands, there's one island in particular that has some 1,600 migrants stuck on it. 16,000. 16,000 migrants because there, you know, obviously there's limited mobility between islands. And of the total, they have around 60,000 60, migrants in the country. So while some aid is coming in from re- relief efforts across the Eurozone, current subsidies are draining funds from Greece's already impoverished coffers. So not, not really good news for Greece. They're taking it on the chin for, for Europe. If you think, if you think about, they've, they've been one of the big intakes, from, especially from Turkey, and they've kept about a third... You know, roughly a third of the uh, the people in that country. So, Darren, there's uh, there's news from China. Yeah. So uh, last year, uh, the the yuan rise and fall was met with a market panic. Uh, you know, the stock market panic that we reported on. Yep. Uh, years ago, uh, but at a point when there are much larger worries, the yuan is hitting a six year low. Uh, which uh, state-run bikes sold off dollars to ease the drop, and the weakened currency ended the week with a slight recovery. So basically, this is uh, an, an, uh, an somewhat extraordinary measure of a central bank to take. So it's this, not just central banks. In fact, state state the so obviously China because it's a communist country, they own a lot of banks. Mm-hmm. So the state owned banks, not right. just the central bank. So right. like they they deployed their fleet of banks to buy up uh Yeah. So uh, basically yuan. when you have something that trades that's not pegged to anything tangible, it's possible there could be a panic and the price could go way down and it it can go the other way too. The price can go way up. But, uh, and so that seems to be what happened with the yuan, that people just started selling their yuan for other currencies, even with the restrictions, they were able to do that. And then, um, and so then the price went down and there's this weird psychological thing that people do that they really shouldn't. But a lot of people see that the price is going down and then they'll sell. They like, oh no, I lost money. Which really, they didn't lose any money. They just kind of, the numbers changed on the sheet. But, um, and so they're like, I better sell before I lose any more. And so a lot of people kind of pile into this and then more and more and more. 
And so what the central bank or the, the state-run banks were able to do is just take their dollars that they have in reserve, and there's a lot of dollars in reserve uh, in, the, in China, and they just took it and they sold it for the yuan, and that basically provides an artificial buoy for the price. And uh, so, so that's why we could see a slight recovery. Not only that, but uh, some people are crediting the, the yuan for the rise in Bitcoin's price over the last week because of the, the increased buying in China. As their yuan loses value, some people are jumping out of yuan into Bitcoin if to it's available. Anything they can get yeah, into. Anything. Yeah. So, so a, it sounds like a mild panic happened over there. Yeah. I, I Not think a that's, serious one, just a mild one, but well, yeah. Right. I think if I think if the world were less stressful, that might have been a more serious panic. Right. Like if there weren't threats of uh, of Russian and U.S. escalating conflicts and things like that. Yeah. Uh, what's but, important is relative. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nuclear war is a really di- big distraction. But uh, we've got uh, um, some more virtual news, I guess. Uh, Facebook. Yeah, Facebook Messenger users can now use PayPal to make purchases through uh, these these weird kind of chatbots that they have on uh, Facebook Messenger. Something they launched not too long ago. Um, they're automated customer service bots that companies can develop to facilitate sort of any number of queries or transactions. There's about thirty thousand of these chatbots on Facebook, and it doesn't look like it's a pretty relatively small number of them that are. Um, interesting or being used to sell products. Um, the most interesting ones I really found were just that Domino's and Pizza Hut uh, have been on top of it for a few months already. So you can uh, make, make now use PayPal to uh, order pizza directly through Domino's or Pizza Hut with Facebook Messenger oh uh, if you're in the U.S. <laughs> right. So, but uh, I don't know. We, what was the Bitcoin pizza story? So I think Bitcoin was way on top of this already like years ago. Yes. Man. So Bitcoin news. and pizza, I think, are, are going to be forever interlinked. I think uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. must, must be. Well, Venezuela escapes bankruptcy. Oil production continues to plunge. Creditors are holding two point eight billion dollars worth of bonds. and have agreed to extend maturities for Venezuela's state-owned petroleum company, Petroleos de Venezuela. Uh, you probably would say that better than me, Randy. After weeks of That's tense good. negotiations and dire warnings of a potential financial collapse, previous notes due in April 2017 and November 2017 were swapped for new notes with annual payments through 2020. PDVSA will issue $3.4 billion in new debt to, compete, uh, to complete the exchange. PDVSA is guaranteed the 2020 bonds by prawning, pawning. F- pawning f- 50.1% of the shares in its U.S. subsidiary, Sitgo Holdings. Wow. That's a, that's a big chunk. That, yeah. So who's, who's buying the Sitgo Holdings? Do, do we know? Nope. Okay. <laughs> PDVSA still has $6.1 billion due in principal payments by the end of 2017. And swaps traders are reported calculating a 51% probability that the company will default in the next 12 months. Venezuelan crude production shrank 11% to 2.3 million barrels a day in... A, wow, I'm just really tripping up on this, Randy. <laughs> a day in the year to September, worse yet, as production decreases, the Wall Street Journal reports a number of the wells in Venezuela are flaring gas and burning oil simply because they lack the funds to get equipment to properly process it. Meanwhile, tensions continue to escalate between Nick, President Nicolas Maduro and his opposition. Late, last week, the country's electoral council nicked the opposition's demands for a referendum to impeach Mr. Maduro, uh, Maduro uh, sparking numerous large protests. The Vatican is now attempting to have the Pope mediate and, quote, build trust between the various parties, unquote. Like, wow. I don't, I don't, maybe, maybe they're bringing the Pope in for last rites. Yeah. Please, <laughs> please, Mr. Pope, come save us. You're from Argentina. That's close to So Venezuela. the Congress has work. voted to try him because he has delayed elections. They were supposed to have a recall election, and he's decided to delay that till next month. The Congress is calling it a coup, and in a, in a meeting that happened, 300 red shirt protesters come busting in. They don't know how they get there because this Congress hall is supposedly under lockdown. But anyway, they, they get him out. They make a vote to try him for some coup, some traitorous uh, coup. And the, the, the question I have is if this guy is like, getting away with everything and doing whatever he wants, and, he, and maybe he has the military on his side, how are you going to... Enforce your trial, right? Do I mean, not. yeah, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Well, Randy, we got a story uh, here back in the United States. 
about uh, yeah, war veterans. Yeah, the Pentagon is stealing from soldiers. Plain and simple. Um, this this is a story coming out of California. The LA Times broke it. Um, basically, when the military was coming up low on mercenaries to go fight in Iraq and Afghanistan a decade ago, uh, the California National Guard lured in nearly 10,000 soldiers uh, with bonuses, these promised enlistment bonuses of $15,000 or more to go off to war. Um, now, as approval ratings and financial support for all of America's wars are dwindling fast, the Pentagon is demanding these enlistment bonuses back. So many of these soldiers were actually deployed into combat on several tours and are now being ordered, well, have been uh, ordered to repay these large enlistment bonuses with interest, mind you, Wow. Uh, under threat of wage garnishments and tax liens if they refuse to comply. Uh, now, naturally... Uh, this is imposing some severe financial hardship on many veterans who say the mili- you know they did nothing wrong. They just took some bonus that was promised to them, a deal that was signed, and now the military is reneging on it. So um, there's some audits that are exposing rampant widespread overpayments uh, by the California National Guard, uh, which was pressured to meet enlistment targets at the height of the war's last Th- decade. This is just uh, this is flabbergasting to me. I mean, like, Randy, consider if I'm the CEO of a company mm-hmm. and I say, hey, I want to hire uh, staff, let's say dishwashers. I want to hire dishwashers at uh, $8 an hour. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to do. And I tell all my managers and everything, $8 an hour, offer them $8 an hour. Now, if one of my managers offered somebody $9 an hour mm-hmm. and somehow was able to pay him because I wasn't paying attention or s- somehow it never got back to me, somebody's making $9 an hour, I don't think I would be able to come against the dishwasher 10 years later. <laughs> for, Can't give me back my dollar an hour. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like right. the dishwasher has no idea what I have in my head. They only know what them and the subordinate said the subordinate to the ceo and so uh, this just makes no sense to me if, if anything maybe come against the recruiter for their money for all the money for everybody that they sign yeah i mean this is gonna be a bunch of people playing hot potato with responsibility just toss it, oh i thought well he signned well but, i you know uh, i I, I'm convoluted i think that what's done is done and it, they should just leave at least with these uh the the foot soldiers they just just let it be well an update from just a few hours ago uh defense secretary ashton b carter announced that he has ordered the pentagon to pause its effort to collect payments <laughs> stick with me here quote until measures can be put in place to provide the affected service members with the support they need to appeal the process wow what a so, jerk he's not saying they're going to stop this no he's saying they're going to temporarily suspend it until there's an appeal process in place. So we're still going to keep sticking it to you, but we're going to give you a chance to, to, to appeal. I mean, are they, are they intentionally trying to piss off these veterans? I mean, many of whom already have issues they're dealing with because of the war, whether it's they're homeless, you know, they're, uh, they're PTSD, they're having suicidal thoughts. Yeah. You know, like there's a lot of issues with this. The, the, all the people that came back, that need help and they're not getting the help they need for one. And now they're like, no, hey, pay us back that bonus money or else. Yep. Well, debit card holders in India beware. As many as 3.2 million card holders may be affected by a huge security breach in India. Hitachi Payment Services provides ATMs and point of sale services. An investigation found a malware induced security breach in their systems. 19 banks report fraudulent transactions. So far, some cards will be reissued while most customers have been asked to change their PIN numbers. So this is a huge thing affecting customers in India. And once again, centralized solutions like this just sort of offer a, a, a honeypot. You know, it's like they got into one, one ATM system from one branch. And because of that, because of all the interlinking and, and how that system works, they were able to, to, to affect cards across multiple branches, multiple banks, and in all over the world, so big story there. And uh, they're 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 promising to act fast. I mean that let's let's be everyone calm down. Everyone that's official in that that area says they're going to act fast. So, um, next up we're going to talk about the crypto. Uh, this this episode has had a lot of of traditional and legacy market discussions, but block size may not be the only option. PhD student Arthur Jaravis 
and the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich have created a simulator that can run Bitcoin proof-of-work simulations with a variety of different parameter changes from block size or block time to network or communication techniques. Quote, according to my research, the one-minute block interval seems like the most plausible. I don't mean that it provides sufficient security, but that it would provide the same security as Bitcoin has today, unquote, Arthur to- Dravis told Coindesk. Naturally, Greg Maxwell, a Bitcoin core contributor, is actually advocating, f- advocating for slightly longer than 10-minute blocks. It seems that core developers will only consider off-chain solutions to Bitcoin's transaction throughput dilemma. Once again... And I think that is that is something that we've taken away from pretty much all of our discussions is that Core will not talk about on-chain solutions. So don't even bring it up. Yeah. So um, anyway, we've got news um, from uh, our local our local uh, area. Bitcoin-based Open Bazaar release, uh, releases a new deploy program. Uh, and a full update. A big issue with the first release from of Open Bazaar was that the need for you to have your node running in the background constantly so that other, other users could browse your goods. Once you shut off your computer, the store would not be viewable. Version 2.0 of Open Bazaar will include an interplanetary file system to distribute data between peers. That is slated for re- release sometime next year. Until then, you can run a new program called Deploy. Working in association with a digital ocean cloud hosting account for $5 a month, one can create a node in the cloud that will host their store data 24-7. OpenBazaar has also released a client-only desktop application. Until now, the desktop application would run a server node in the background whether you were using that functionality or not. So big big news from uh, uh, OpenBazaar, and we're, we're definitely going to try to get Chris back on the show. Well, and uh, the Ethereum attacks, basically, the, the DDoS we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, can might be traceable. So there's been a series of attacks that's been plaguing the Ethereum network for the past month or so. Um, some, serious, some serious internet sleuthing has gone down, and uh, the IP address of the attacker has apparently been discovered. Um, there's some Bitcoin blockchain transactions that uh, link the attacker to a Dwarf Pool mining account. Yes, and so, Dwarf Pool has... Uh, given that information to, I guess, the Ethereum Foundation once they figured out which account was uh, mining. So the, basically, the attacker was also running a, a what they believe is a four-card rig. It's a 125 mega hash rig, um, similar to something that we're experienced running uh, for Ethereum. And it all links back to that. And he didn't obscure some sort of movement of, of coins between that and how he funded some of the attacks. So they were able to trace it back to that account. Now it's a matter of what do you do with that information? So uh, Ethereum Classic is in the news and they're upgrading. They've had a successful hard fork. The attacks that led to the second hard fork of Ethereum has also affected Ethereum Classic, causing the developers to hard fork the blockchain with the same gas repricing fix. Quote, because of the technical nature of this fork and important security vulnerabilities it addresses, there was no contention about it within the community, unquote. Lead developer Arvico told Coindesk. But that's not the only change. The developers have been busy with changes that include a removal of the mining difficulty bomb slated for next summer. Yeah, we talked about this Ethereum uh, hard fork last week on last week's show. And uh, yeah, just basically repricing the gas so that... uh, contracts don't continue to execute uh to reduce spam basically right so, just to make it to uh, they were they were calling it to better align the amount of computational power that each uh, op code uses and and really the fact that something like this ha- happened is should not be surprising i mean it's amazing that uh satoshi nakamoto the when he set up bitcoin he got some parameters to be in pretty much sweet spots i feel uh, so in Ethereum, there is so many more parameters to be, to be set. The fact, I mean, it is not a reasonable task to assume that you'll get them all right, right off the get go. It's right. just such a, a, a project, such a massive amount of information to keep in your head. So, uh, the fact that they need to tweak the prices of things, uh, that's not, uh, too surprising in my view. And also, um, the, uh, also the, that that's that the fact they fixed it is is a positive thing i think yeah well for more information about like uh, ether and the difference between ether and gas uh definitely check out last week's show okay. oh i listened to that i know i 
<laughs> I wanted to chime in about the gas. Yeah, go. So uh, gas is basically uh, a, a unit that uh, contracts on Ethereum use. So they tick away a unit of gas. Now, gas is, there's not a special coin or, or token for gas. Gas is actually something that's priced in terms of Ethereum. So uh, the, the intention is that the gas price changes in terms of Ethereum, but yet this type of computation still uses five gas. Okay. So that the the actual Ethereum cost can change, but it still uses five gas. So you can uh, kind of evaluate the computational difficulty with this gas term. And the, the reason why the gas price changes is it actually is intending to keep the dollar price you pay in fees uh, uh, almost constant or, or close, not, not varying wild, wildly. That was the intention of the way it's set up. Excellent. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, like the one we played with Roger Vera and about Bitcoin Unlimited. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and more. Neocash Radio. This is JJ. This is Darren. And Randy. For Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.